Uh, thanks to Christian Skaters for having me and Tony and Yuli. This is awesome. It's a privilege and an honor for me to be here. This is probably the first time I've done anything like this. And so I just want you to know that I take this serious. I take uh, the word of God serious. I don't do this because, uh, you know, I'm anyone or anything or because I have all the Bible knowledge in the world or I think I'm somebody. I do this in fear and trembling. I do this in all humility. And I do it because of the compassion of Jesus that has changed my life. And um, when you actually feel that and you know that and you're in love with God, um, you just share it. And whatever that means, it, whether it's your talent, skills, <clears throat> by word, by your life, by your actions, somehow, some way, uh, you can't contain it and you just want to share what God has done in your life. So in saying that, I'm super, super grateful. Um, if you do have your Bibles, we're going to be jumping into Mark 5. And uh, I just wanted to kind of set the story. Obviously, in this story, we'll read about Jesus, which I think is one of the cool stories in the gospel. And we'll read about a man. Um, and I'll give you a little background on this certain area that we'll be reading about in that story and then kind of bring you up to date on the story um, and the time when Jesus is doing this, and then maybe even see um, what kind of relation that we have um, to not only to Jesus, but to this man in particular um, here in this day and age. And I know in being with you guys last week, you know, the heart of Christian skaters and a lot of you guys on here is ministry. And so you're driven to, to your heart is to reach the loss. You know, your heart is to go out. And a lot of that is trying to figure out, you know, how to do that, what to do. Um, what is my calling in the Lord? And so maybe this can just be hopefully an encouragement to every single one of us, knowing that God is using um, every single one of us. So in uh, Mark 5, the story is, <laughs> we'll be reading about Jesus and, the man, and this man in the tombs. And uh, I just want to set the, the, the picture real quick. Um, we'll be on the countryside of, um, of the Gadarenes. And I uh, had the luxury and the privilege of being in this actual spot, so I can vouch for it. Um, I looked over into these cliffs and the Sea of Galilee. I've seen these tombs. Uh, it's an actually, it's an amazing, amazing spot. Um, but this is the countryside on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, and it leads up into the Golan Heights. And there's a lot of history um, throughout the Old Testament and the Bible in this area. And um, as we're reading this story, we'll see that it's referred to as the country side of the Gadarenes and um, of the Gerasenes. And later on, it's not a biblical city, but then you, you, it would be established as the city of Gadara. And so we'll do a little quick little history. I know our attention span is so, so minimal. So we'll try to get through this. There's just so much good stuff in here. It's hard to, to get it all out so quickly. But so here we are on the countryside. You know what, let's pray real quick before we, we get going. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. Thank you for every single uh, person that joined us today, God. I pray, Lord, that you would be with us. God, we invite you here, Holy Spirit, to be with us, Lord. Thank you for your word, Lord, that is breathing and it's living. Thank you that it speaks to us, God. May we continue to fall more and more in love with it, God, as you speak to our souls. And I just pray again, Lord, for every person here that you would bless them, you would watch over them, protect them in these crazy times. Be all the comfort, strength that they need in their hearts and minds, Lord, trusting in you, God, and knowing that you are in control. And Lord, we just commit this time to you and ask that um, we would just get a little treasure out of your word for our lives this day, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So here we have this countryside of the Gadarenes, right? And some of you Bible scholars, you know, you know that going back to, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you'll some of you know that Jacob, whose later name would be changed to Israel, he had a bunch of sons. And he had one particular son whose name was Gad. Okay. And so here's a little bit about Gad. I wrote down a bunch of stuff. We know that his father was Jacob, his mother was Leah. And a little fun fact it says uh, when Leah became barren, I mean, she couldn't have kids. She actually had Jacob lie with her maidservant Zilpah. And Gad would be the seventh son born to Jacob and the first child to Zilpah, just a Bible fun fact. And in these days, when you go back to Genesis, you have Jacob and you have his sons. 
And when Gad was born, this is what Leah said. Genesis 30, 11 says that Leah said, a troop comes. So she called his name Gad. In another version, the NIV version, it says that when he was born, she said, what good fortune. So she named him Gad. And that reminds me of something I didn't say. I was going to name this study Man of the Tombs, but I decided to change it into Here Come the Troops. And we'll talk about that later. <laughs> so Leah screams out, the troop comes. She screams out, what good fortune. And so I found out that Gad means good fortune. Okay. So here you have Gad and you have uh, his, his brothers and you have Jacob. And then through the life of Jacob, when it's time for him to pass, here he is in Genesis 49, and he's blessing his sons, and he's given a little word over his sons. And so in Genesis 49, 1, it says, and Jacob called his sons and said, gather together that I might tell you what shall befall you in the last days. And so he goes through and he starts saying a lot of cool stuff about his sons, and then he finally gets to Gad, and he says, he says this, and maybe it's sweet, maybe, I don't know. But in, when it gets to verse 19, it says, when he reaches Gad, he says, Gad, a troop shall come upon him, but he shall triumph at last. And when we read the scriptures and, and in the history of the scriptures, then we, we do find out. And this is when Jacob and God, and then they established the 12 tribes of Israel. That may, may be a familiar um, word to you guys or words to you, the 12 tribes of Israel. And Gad would go on and head up the tribe of Gad. And when you read in the Bible about these stories, um, that were given us, you know, we can tell that the tribe of Gad, that they were mighty warriors. Um, they were, you know, there were these soldiers and, um, and they had a job to do. And there's even a short description uh, about the tribe of Gad in First Chronicles 12, 8, where it says, this is cool, he said, they were brave warriors, ready for battle and able to handle the shield and spear. Their faces were the faces of lions and they were as swift as gazelles in the mountains. So that gives us a little, uh, little picture of this tribe of Gad. And then later on, we'll move down the line in, in history, uh, close to even 400 years later. Most of you guys know about the story of Moses. Um, quick cap of Moses, you have Egypt, you have Pharaoh. Uh, the Hebrews were slaves in Egypt. They wandered in the desert for 40 years. Um, they crossed to the Red Sea and most of them even crossed over in the promised land. You guys have seen the old movies and maybe even the new movie and or heard the stories, but there's the there's the picture of Moses. Um, and then later on in the end of uh, Moses's life, he would go on to say this about um, the tribe of Gad. Again, he would say all these things about the tribe of Israel, but when he reached um, the tribe of Gad, he said, he said in Deuteronomy 33, 20 and 21, about Gad, he said, blessed is he who enlarges God, Gad's domain, <clears throat> Gad's territory. Gad lives there like a lion, tearing at arm or head. And then he goes on to say in 21, when the heads of the people assembled, he carried out the Lord's righteous will and his judgments concerning Israel. So here you picture this tribe of Gad, mighty warriors, carrying out this, the Lord's righteous will and his judgments concerning uh, Israel. And so... Here we have on this on this this countryside um, east side of the the Sea of Galilee, and we know at this time after Moses and and the tribes of Israel spread out. Like I said, some of them crossed over, some of them went to the Promised Land um, for reasons uh, we know. A, that's another story. But the tribe of Gad resided in this region along with the tribe of Reuben and half of the tribe of Manasseh. So here you have this countryside. There was a lot of uh, Lots of room for um, their herds and their flocks, and it's just a whole nother, um, you know, a beautiful side of this this little part in Israel to to start fresh. Okay, so that's this little old story of this. So if you can picture that in this countryside, where we'll be reading this story. So here we go, and we'll step into Mark five if you guys are there. And so now, this is now actually almost fourteen hundred years later. So fast forward, a lot of stuff has has changed. Um, Jesus is stepping onto the scene here in Mark 5. And this is, like I said, almost 14 years, 1400 years later. Uh, a lot has changed. Uh, once this was a countryside of warriors and Israelites, a lot of them, you know, practicing um, 
um, Jewish traditions and customs, but a lot has changed now that Jesus is stepping on the scene and most of this area is, uh, has become a multiple cities uh, made up of all kinds of different um, people. And a lot of these people is a, you know, more of a melting pot and it was ruled by pagan teachings and, and Greek philosophers. And now we have Jesus stepping onto the scene, starting off Mark five, and we'll, we'll get into that. And just to preface this story, some of you guys might remember that right, right before Jesus steps on the shore, the night before he was on the Sea of Galilee, big, huge storm, uh, thunder, lightning, everything's going crazy. The sea's gonna swallow them up, swallow them up. The disciples are freaking out. And then here we see just another day for Jesus, um, you know, calming uh, this storm and having dominion over um, these, these elements of nature. And again, proving um, who he is. And so right after this, this is when Jesus pulls up, steps on the shore and this will start our story. All right, so if you guys are there, Mark five, we'll keep it rolling. All right, Mark 5, verse 1, we're going through 1 to 20. <laughs> it says, then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. This is what we've been talking about, the countryside of the Gadarenes. Notice it says other side. Uh, a lot of people assume this is the side of the Gentiles. We'll take a, in a few verses uh, from here, we'll figure out why this might be the side of the Gentiles. Verse 2, and when he had come out of the boat immediately there, met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him, not even with chains. Verse four, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains and the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. So here we have this man who's demon possessed, obviously has supernatural powers. Um, no one can bind him. No one wants anything to do with him. He's left alone here on this countryside and in these, and in these tombs by himself being tormented um, by the devil and no one wants anything to do with him. Verse five, and always, always night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying out and cutting himself with stones. Now, just a little side note, we won't spend too much time here, but a little side note just for food for thought. A lot of you guys who are in ministry and, and you, counsel people, um, especially me being in ministry and being around a lot of young people that cutting seems to be um, more common these days than ever before. And so, like I said, I won't touch much on this. That's food for thought, another, another story, another conversation, but notice the spiritual torment um, that comes along with depression, comes along with suicide, loneliness. This guy is by himself. Uh, alone by himself with his own thoughts and the enemy is doing a work on him. And just so, again, just notice the cutting with stones, but different conversation. Verse six, when, Jesus, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. So now that's the demon speaking. And notice that the demons recognize who Jesus is. They recognize him as the son of God. Uh, it was another cool thing in, in, in Matthew, I think it's Matthew 9, he actually, the demons actually say to Jesus, have you come, um, he said, you come to torture us, but what's the word? Let me see, let me run it back real quick. Well, no, I won't go back. They, the, 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 the point is that they recognize who Jesus is and they actually, they recognize their eternal fate. And so they're asking Jesus not to, to um, do this to them. So with verse eight, it says, for he said to them, this is Jesus. He said, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Verse nine, then he asked them, what is your name? And the man answers <clears throat> saying, my name is Legion for there are many. Uh, and just a side note, we know that this guy's demon possessed. We know that this demon, the name is Legion. And I was always taught or told like, yeah, a like thousand demons, you know, 2000 demons, whatever. No one really has actual count. But when I was actually in Israel and I was talking with some of the Jewish brothers over there, they had mentioned that, well, yeah, but this is Roman times. And then, you know, this was a Ro Roman legion. And, you know, and in a Roman legion, you had anywhere from four to 6,000 uh, soldiers and uh, not to mention the horsemen. So if you could just imagine, we don't know the number, it's not the point. 
There's a lot of demons here messing with this dude. Verse 10, also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. So here they are begging Jesus and asking him of this. Verse 11, so now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. Remember in verse one, when we said the other side, well, we assume that this is a Gentile side because, well, we have some pigs rolling around. It's not very kosher to have pigs uh, rolling around. And so we can assume that, um, you know, again, mixed cultures, this could be a business. There's all kinds of um, possibilities in this. 12, so all the demons begged him saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirit went out and entered the swine it says that there were about 2,000 of them, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea, uh, into the sea, and drowned in the sea. And another cool spot about this place that I've been to in Israel, all around the Sea of Galilee, there's shorelines, and in this one particular place that we're talking about, and with the tomb, I was actually was there, got to see with my own eyes, but it actually comes to a steep. So this is the only side on this exact same spot that the scriptures are describing where there is actually a cliff over the Sea of Galilee. And, and it, it, it's like you have this, the shore and then it comes up at this one point right here and there's this cliff. So it makes perfectly sense that this cliff exists over the cliff would go straight into the Sea of Galilee. And I've seen it myself. And so it makes sense, um, you know, in reading the scripture that we, they ran over and and they jumped over this cliff and they landed straight into the Sea of Galilee. <clears throat> Verse 15, when they came to Jesus and saw the one, let's see, is that where I left? No, for, 14. So those who fed the swine fled and they told it in the city and in the country and they went out to see what it was uh, that had happened. So you have all the pig feeders and the people around them, they took off um, to go tell on Jesus. In verse 15, it says, then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid. Now, in those times, it wasn't like, you know, we think of countryside or cities and um, there still was some distance, but it's, it still took a little bit of time. Who knows exactly how long they went to go tell on Jesus. I'm sure it could have been hours. It could have been all day. It could have been overnight. Who knows? Um, but I do believe that Jesus actually, he didn't just go there and then, you know, do this awesome miracle and then say, later, I'm out of here. He, he went there for a reason. Um, he, he just calmed down the storms. He went through a crazy night with the disciples. He had intention to go to this other side with this man in mind. And this man was on the heart and mind of Jesus. And this was the only reason that God went through this crazy storm, went and did all this stuff, was to meet this man. So I, I'm not assuming that he went there did another cool miracle that he's doing every day and just said, peace, I'm out of here. I actually do believe that Jesus, while these people were gone telling on Jesus, he was actually spending time with them. And that's where we think about making disciples of men and, and the relationships that Jesus has and, and how he cares about us individually. And it's not just about this one act or that act or looking a certain way, but it's that he makes this personal connection um, with us individually. So I do believe that Jesus did um, spend time with this guy. Uh, let's see, where am I at? 15? Okay, so it says they were that they saw this man. He was sitting in cl and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Now, that doesn't make sense that they would be afraid of him. This man was sitting next to Jesus. He was clothed in his, in his right mind. Um, it makes no sense um, that they would be afraid of, of him or Jesus. 16 says, and those who saw it, told them now, or told them how it happened to him who had been demon possessed and about the swine, uh, 17. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. Now that makes no sense that you, you would think if these people were here, they heard this guy screaming out saying this was the son of God. Uh, they knew who this man was and now they're seeing him sitting clothed in his right uh, frame of mind. You think that they would be wondering who is this dude? Who is this guy that did this? This is the man I need to know, you know? And Jesus, we don't think of him as being famous, but he was in this countryside. People knew who Jesus was. They were surrounding him by the thousands and thousands, always wanting something from him. And whether sometimes it was genuine, sometimes it was to get what they wanted. 
Um, but so they, they had to have known at this point who this guy was. But for some reason, they were afraid. They don't want anything to do with Jesus. And, uh, you know, my only thought is, is, is why? Why would they ask Jesus to leave? Uh, maybe they just cared more uh, about themselves um, than they did uh, about this man or even getting to know who Jesus was. Or like I said, maybe these pigs, uh, this was a part of business. And now Jesus came and he disrupted their normal life. You know, um, you would think that this man would have been disruption, screaming, crying, wailing out in the countryside, but they just ignored him, you know, out of sight, out of mind, who cares? Um, but now Jesus is a disruption and what for, that's not why he came, but to them, instead of being a blessing, he's being a disruption um, to their, their way of living. Um, and so they'd rather ignore um, the need to save this guy, to, to, to know who Jesus is, to, you know. They cared more about themselves. That's, that's my thought. Um, so verse 19 is another cool thing. 19, it says, however, Jesus did not, um, no, verse 18. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. So here you have this guy after spending time with Jesus, all that he did, He's begging um, to go with Jesus. And I just, I don't want to take too much time, but you think just how intimate, like this guy, how long, we don't know how long he was there in torment and agony. You know, no one ever listened to him. No one would speak to him. He never was able to hug anybody, you know, and it, any affection and to embrace anybody. No one cared about who this guy was. So imagine all that Jesus did. Not only did he, did he, did he, heal him and he take away the demon but whatever Jesus did the companion that or the compassion that he showed him this guy was just he just wanted to be with Jesus and I find myself and, and a lot of you guys too where we don't have things figured out we don't a lot of times we're still tripping on what's going on in our lives what's going on in the past but and we're not perfect human beings and, and we mess up all the time but I know that I'm sure every single one of you can agree with and when you're when you're walking in your life living for Jesus is genuine word. Most of the time, it's just that simple. It's like, I just want to be with them. For some reason, in this, the madness of this dude, something made sense. And he's trying to figure it out. And he's saying, I just want to be with you, Jesus. Like, dude, if that was me. I'd be like, I'm, wherever you go, I'm going. There's nothing for me here. I just want to be with you, Jesus. And so I found this interesting. Um, I did notice that, I took notice that the, the, the demons asked Jesus to do something. Don't, don't, don't get rid of us. And Jesus said, yes. The people said, get out of here. We don't want you in our town. And then Jesus says, yes. But then when this guy asked him, Jesus says, no. I just thought, side note, I thought that was interesting, but because in verse 19, after he asked him, Jesus, I just, or just tell him, I just want to be with you, Jesus. Verse 19 says, however, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. Verse 20, it says that uh, when he departed and began, and he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. So picture this countryside. The Decapolis was 10 cities. Dica meaning 10, Polis meaning 10 cities. I believe, and again, I'm not a Bible scholar. I believe that this was possibly one of the first evangelists, one of the first missionaries right? Here you have this guy so grateful for what Jesus did, and he begs to go with him, and Jesus says, nope, you can't. And so Jesus already had a plan. He went over here to set this man free, to love him, to be with him, but he already had a plan um, for his life. So notice what he says. There's three things that he tells him, and we're just going to break it down a little bit. So number one, Jesus says, go home to your friends. So a lot of you guys are asking and wondering, what do I do? I want to be used by God as a call in my life. You know, where do I go? That's something you got to figure out where God is calling you. And whether it's home to the people you know, or whether it's across the world to people you don't know. But ultimately, uh, 
our hearts are to reach those that are lost, those that are dying and going to hell without Jesus. We know that and we believe that in our heart burns with compassion to do whatever we can that we might win some to the Lord and for his kingdom. And so Jesus told him, go home to your friends. The second one, he said, tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. Now imagine this guy, I just wanna say every single one of us and you guys that your testimony is a weapon, it's, it's powerful. The story that you have of God, this story that this guy has right now and that he will have is a powerful weapon. And Jesus is telling him right now, go and tell your friends, just tell them what I did for you. Uh, the third thing he says is, well, let me read real quick. In Revelations 12, 11, it says that, and they have defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony, and, that, and they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. So this guy at first, that's all we have. All we have is our story. All we have is our testimony. Those of you with that burning desire, man, I just want to tell people about Jesus. What do I do? No, I, I don't have the skills. I don't have no talents. I don't even know any memory verses. I don't even know the scripture. Right off the bat, your first thing is your story. It is your testimony because it comes down to what Jesus did, not what we're doing. And so you guys are in a good starting position. All of us are in a great starting position to go out and to win souls for Jesus. The third thing he said to tell them, not only did he say, go and tell them what great things God has done for you, but he said, tell them how he had compassion on you. And it really comes down, I mean, starting your ministry or how could, you know, thinking, how can I be used by God? It really does, it starts with your story, but a lot of this has to do with just compassion. What, what are your reasons? Why, why are you doing this? You know, is it to be the next cool hip thing? Is it this or that competition with this or that? Or is it, I just want to see people get saved. I've been playing music for so long and I, I know that God's used me and I'm humbled and honored, but I, I, I still question things and I still, God, I just, I just want to be used by you. Like most people look at me, dude, God has used you mighty, bro. Really? <laughs> My heart is like, I, I want to be used by the Lord. Like right now. I don't want a resume. I want to be used by God right now. I want to know that God is constantly doing something in my life. And it's all for the same reasons, because I'm grateful. I'm still stoked, almost 30 years later, walking with Jesus, what he's done for me in my life. Had nothing to do with after. I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff after, but that moment when I knew that I knew that I knew who Jesus was, that was the moment that I said, I do that. I, just want, I want people to know. I want people to know what, what, you've, what you've done for me. And so again, our stories, our testimonies might be the only thing we have right off at the back. I just wanna give you some examples and I'll just read off these verses, but we're constantly seeing in the, in the scriptures about our Jesus, the compassion over and over and over again, the compassion, the compassion that Jesus had. And I'm just gonna read off a few scriptures and then we'll try to wrap it up. Uh, the compassion of Jesus in Matthew 9, um, 35 through 38. It says, then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were wearied, weary and scattered. In another version, it says they were harassed and helpless like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers in the harvest. And I know that's why you guys are here. Why else would you tune into a Bible study on Tuesday night? Weekly. <laughs> you guys are committed because God has changed your life. Jesus has done some in your life. And you want people to know that from every, every scale. Not that it has anything to do with us, but you want people to know about this Jesus. And I did, I looked up, uh, I like to write lyrics and then I, I like, like to look up synonyms and all kinds of different, you know, meanings of words, but I'm going to ramble off a bunch of words. And if any of them stick to you or mean anything, um, so be it. But I, 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 I looked up compassion in the synonyms and I just wrote down all the words that stood out to me. So I'll read it off real quick. Pity, empathy, kindness, caring, 
gentleness, benevolence, sympathy, humanity, affection, mercy, tenderness, emotion, passion, grief, love, understanding, care, sensitivity, condolence, concern, warm heartedness, gratitude, humility, generosity, selfishness, selflessness, courage, thankfulness, loving kindness, thoughtfulness, graciousness, gratefulness, sincerity, forgiveness. And then here's two that really stood out to me and spoke to my heart. Tolerance and leniency was the compassion of Jesus. And Jesus did tell us in scripture, he said, therefore, you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel. We know this. I believe that's the heart of every single one of you guys. But we're just focusing on this, on this particular story about this man. And we're remembering that Jesus told this particular man, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. It's your guys' story. It's simple. Uh, it's your story that's filled with Jesus and the great things he has done for you. And nobody can tell your guys' story better than you guys. And for most of us, we know that the gospel means good news. And Jesus said to preach the gospel. He told us to preach the gospel. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go into all the world and preach the good news. So now taking us back to our little story of Gad. Remember it meant good fortune. I just kind of tied this good fortune. Preach this good fortune. Preach this good news uh, um, to those who would listen. And so back to the story of Gad and, and this man here. We know the tribe of Gad, is, you know, and, and again, I'm not a scholar and I'm not saying these are all the exact things that happen, but I like to dream. When I read my Bible, I like to dream. I like to picture and envision things that's tangible, that's real, that was possible, not just all this kind of just stiff stuff that I just can't relate to, but I see Jesus, I see his humanity, just like you and I and I, and I, and I think about how we would hang together or we would be together and the jokes that we would do and you know the, just the realness of Jesus. Not this superhero, untouchable guy that's like, well, it's Jesus, and I'll keep my distance and let him do his thing. It's like, no, he, Jesus was the, he was, he specialized in relationships. And if he was sitting by the fire with his boys all the time, there was an intimate, intimate relationship there that we'll probably never understand until we actually get a chance to experience it face to face. But it's a, it's a, it's a realness sometimes I think people put on the back burner. Um, and then it, it isn't, I don't know, you don't, not all the times you want to go for it. If you don't, if you know Jesus is right there, want ready to wrestle with you, you're gonna jump in and wrestle, and you're gonna you're gonna go for it because you're you guys are boys, you guys are like this, and uh, so so we're going back to this guy and the tribe of Gad, and we know, and this is my story. Maybe this guy, right, this demon possessed guy, maybe he was a descendant of the the tribe of Gad. Maybe he was bred to be a warrior. Maybe he, you know. This, this was all kind of maybe in his history, in his DNA. Um, I remember when Moses, um, let's see. Okay, this is, this is the thing. Maybe, maybe he knew the, these old stories uh, about the tribes of Israel and how powerful they were. And, and maybe he just lost his way. Um, maybe, or maybe he never knew the way. We, we don't know. Maybe he was always on the opposite tracks of, of God and he just was causing havoc here's this this lonesome crazy warrior causing havoc and maybe he somehow found himself in sin and he got demon possessed and here we go we don't know any of that story about his past but we do know the story and we know about the compassion of Jesus in his life at this moment and that's the story that this guy is going off of and remember when I said Moses he said that these um these warriors, they would carry out God's righteousness and carry out his judgments. And maybe that's the, the history of where this guy comes from. Maybe, maybe he remembers his great, 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 great granddaddy telling him stories about when we were, you know, the, this tribe has done this and has done that. And we marched the gates and we busted down the walls and 
he's coming from this warrior um, mentality, uh, you know, of this stern, strict, righteous hand of God and all these amazing, crazy stories, but he's never experienced that. But now he's experiencing God's righteousness for the first time through Jesus. And maybe it's in a, it's in a new way. It's God's righteousness, but maybe he's experiencing it for the first time in a new way. And I just want to read off the righteousness of Jesus. A few scriptures real quick that describes this righteousness. Romans 3.22, it says, This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and the righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Romans, Romans 1.17 says, For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Second Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And Matthew 6.33 says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Maybe this guy is, he's, he's, He's experiencing this righteousness of Jesus firsthand. He's, he's experiencing this compassion, uh, compassion, companionship, this friendship, knowing that he was lost and Jesus fought through the storm and even told the storms to chill out so that he can get to this other side for this specific reason was to be with this man. And so wrapping up why I called it Here Come the Troops is because here we are, the story of battle and this DNA of these warriors and stuff, but maybe God is raising up these different troops, you know? We're not always supposed to be these mighty, these tough old guys. It's just this simplicity of surrendering ourselves and humbling um, ourselves to Jesus and wanting to be used and asking God to use us. And I believe that you guys are these new troops. I believe you guys are these new warriors and I believe that it's your story and your actions uh, are the new good fortune that we read about. Your stories and your actions are the new good fortune. And it's the new story that needs to be told because it's about Jesus and what he did for us that has changed us forever. He is our one and only motivator. And so my encouragement is that you guys use your story, use your testimonies, and on, a, and on a scale of a, of a one to a hundred of all the gifts and spiritual tools you might have or might possess in the future, one being from one to a hundred, one just being your story and so on. I mean, attain all that stuff, use all that. God will show you all that stuff. But if one to a hundred, if one is just your testimony, your story is powerful. Even if that's the only weapon you have in your arsenal, it is powerful. And you will gain more weapons and more tools and God will use you and you will become more powerful and more awesome. And so if one being your story and so on, whether you're a pastor, whether you're a Bible teacher, you're a Bible professor, a Bible scholar, a theologian, a cat who studies apologetics, maybe you're the smartest Bible guy ever. Maybe you're the holiest man ever. Maybe you're an athlete. Maybe you're an artist. Maybe you're a musician. Uh, maybe you're a skater or whether you're nobody like me like this man it is and it will always be about Jesus so let Jesus do it don't get ahead of him don't fall too far behind Maybe he'll let you go with them in that boat. But if not, then you go wherever he calls you to go, whenever he tells you to go. And then you just tell him how good and how wonderful and how compassionate Jesus was to you. And people will listen. So God bless you guys, man. Thank you for listening to me. I hope I didn't run uh, too much over time. And hopefully I'll be joining you guys on, on more Tuesdays just to hang out and learn from you guys and to listen and just always uh, keep a pulse on the heart of what you guys are doing, man, because I am always encouraged um, by the next young dude or next young woman who just, and a lot of it is just forsaken all and just says, man, I just want to tell people about Jesus. 
I just want God to use my life. It's pure, it's honest, it's genuine. And I know from experience without being the most equipped or the most knowledgeable, when you have the willing heart and you say, here I am, Jesus, use my life, get ready for a, a wild ride because he'll do it. So I love you guys, man. Thank you for listening to me. All right, guys. Sonny, thank you so much. That was really awesome. Um, we're going to open it up a little bit. I'm going to have Tony kind of read up some questions or some people uh, writing some questions. And if you guys want to write some questions, um, but there's a, a real interesting one. I'm going to let Tony go with it. So, so son, Sonny, somebody asked, you one time said that you um, not ever wanted to leave the spot of brokenness. What has that meant for you and how has that helped your story? My, my spot of brokenness? Yes, that you didn't want to ever leave your spot of brokenness. Well, I think that's when, you know, growing up, I, you know, I mean, I grew up in a Catholic family and I, you know, I've said this in my testimony was like, I, I never hated God growing up. I never had beef against God growing up. It was just that I didn't, I didn't know him. You know, I knew of him. I, I knew a lot, a lot of religious ways uh, uh, around him. And, but until it became real, and personal in my own life. And that was by watching my mother pass away of cancer. It was seeing real love and seeing the real Jesus in, 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 in her life, by her actions, by, by her doing, that's when I knew that I wanted it. And when I was watching her die, it was me asking God, I found that broken spot. And, that, and I was, when I prayed and I said, you know, God, if you take my mom, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'll, I'm going to lose it, you know, but in my heart of, 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 sorry, I just see my sister Kyra on there and she lost her mom last week. Yeah, it's heavy. Thank you, Sonny, for being real, man. I got you. I got you. I love you, Kyra. That's when I found that broken spot where I said, I don't need... Anyone to tell me I'm a sinner. I don't need nobody throwing the Bible at me and no one beating me down. I know who I am because I could see that I'm not my mom. I'm not someone who knows Jesus. I'm not someone who loves Jesus and walks with Jesus, but I want to be. And I said, God, if you can do that, I said, please come into my heart. Because, But I want, my, I want my mom's Jesus. I don't want this religious Jesus. I don't want this misconstrued Jesus. I don't even want this... TBN event, this all these holy water throwing at me, asking for my money, Jesus. I don't want any of that. I want the Jesus that I see in my mom. And if you can do that, I'll try my best. I will try my best. And when I prayed that prayer, I felt that it was real. And that was my broken spot. And that day when I whispered into my mom's ears, I said, go be with Jesus. Then she would take her last breath and go be with Jesus, knowing that I was going to be all right. And so I hold that to this day, not that I'm perfect or not that I got it all figured out, but I'm still that young kid, 19, just trying, trying to make my moms happy, trying to, to understand what God has for me in my life, trying to be a better husband and, and a better father and better friend. And, and I need to stay in that broken spot. If not, then it'll just be sunny spot. And when it's sunny spot, then there's a lot of damage that can be done. Hold on one second. Just lost you for a second. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, I think a lot of us, you know, have been impacted by, you know, people in our lives and and people we've lost and and you know, super thankful for the people who impacted us and, and actually showed us what it was like to live live a life with Jesus. So right. um any other questions? I mean, I know Sonny, I was impacted by the music of POD even before I knew POD had anything to do with uh, Jesus, you know, I was impacted. I mean, I remember watching it on MTV and all the partying and you know what I mean? And, and it would come on, you know, and I love the music. So I, I think God's going to use that, you know? So yeah, it's man. pretty awesome, man. It is awesome. You know? <laughs> I lost you guys. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I lost your video here. So I, could, I, could, I could still hear you. That's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care if you see me. I just want to hear you guys. <laughs> I don't know what happened. So hold on one second. Let me yeah. see if I can fix it. But um, 
Get, get whatever, you know, whatever uh, technical difficulties, we're just going to roll with it. I wish I, go. oh, there you are. Cool. I can hear you guys though. So it's all good. Um, <laughs> you don't need to see me. I just want to hear you guys. I know. Um, I mean, yeah, Billy just lost his mom a year ago from cancer and it's hard even as an adult, Never mind. you know, 19 year olds. And I know you have a daughter that's not far away from that age. So it's just really difficult. So, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the next question was, what would you say to the person who feels like no matter what he does for God, it's not enough, even though we know it's not about work? I think that's just a lot of things that it also depends on how you, you know, like the fellowship that you have and the church that you attend and, and the accountability that you have. It's like, that's, that's, that's wickedness that, that, and that's the enemy that, that tries to distract us for forever. You know, I, I always felt that way. And, and a lot of it, it, it really just had to do with people saying, well, you're not good enough. It was never God saying that you're not good enough. God said, I love you, dude. From this point on, whatever, let's just roll together. Just, we'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. Let me teach you, you know. But when I became a Christian, it was, um, you know, it was, oh, well, that's not Christian. And, and your tattoos aren't Christian. And your music's not Christian. And all these things that I wasn't Christian. It was like, well, dude, I'm ready to just give up. I just want to, well, yeah, I guess, I guess that's not me. I guess this isn't for me. But the more you grow and the more you know, it's more just getting closer to the heart of God. And then even for years, even in my own journey, where I, I had to stop and just try to figure it out and say, dude, and again, go back and find my broken spot and say, dude, I just want to be used by God. There was such a whirlwind of music and POD and success and a lot of things where my faith and a lot of stuff was put to test and, and, and was challenged. But, you know, and through all that, even though you, people could say, oh, dude, you've done a lot of cool stuff. You always feel like it's never, it's never good enough but don't don't let the enemy do that to you know that god is gonna use you from from on whatever scale or capacity that you're willing to do um and that's a good thing that you wanted to be by god but don't let it distract you or or, or you know frustrate you that you're not doing enough just a lot of times people try to do so much and and they're really their ears aren't really open to what god's doing or what's even doing in their own life they just want to do something and if you just want to do something and not really know who Jesus is, then what's what's the point? I'd rather know who Jesus is and sit right here and talk to you guys every Tuesday, knowing that I know that I know, than think that I'm busy, busy, busy. And now look at me. I look like the most holiest guy in the world out there. But really, I have no time and I don't know who Jesus is. I love, um, you know, the it's Psalm 118 8 that says it's better to trust in the Lord than to trust a man because man's always going to let you down. and and too often we focus on, you know, our problems instead of focusing on Jesus and his promises. And I think that's kind of, I mean, it's just a constant distraction and it's always just refocusing our eyes on his promises and not what the world's saying all around you. Yeah, yeah. We have to do that more than ever. I, I, that's what I feel like God's been speaking to my heart. Just is, I've said this before, which is be still and know that I am God. We have more time to, to rest and relax and and then there's so much going on, daily changes uh, politically, you know, all this stuff going on, we can get so lost and frustrated and, you know, what, what's going to happen, in, you know, especially our futures financially, you know, dude, are we going to be like this forever? When can I go outside? I'm stuck at home and our minds could just wander and go bananas. And so I'm trying the best that I can. And I, I thank you guys for letting me do this study because a lot of it really has just been forced to sit down and just spend that time with God. And even yesterday thinking, oh, I'll just write something real quick. And then my wife was like, you're going to come to bed? <laughs> I was like, you been doing that I'm like, dude, I got lost. I got lost in it, you know? And I was like, man, when's the last time I just got lost in God's word like that, you know? And it was, it was awesome. So we, we have another question that says, um, and this is something um, a lot of people don't think about, but um, touring around the world with P.O.D. and um, you're away from your family a lot and your church family and and just you know the people who who really pour into you. So somebody asked, um, is there any things that you battle when you're on tour? You know what it says in touring all over the world. Is there any addictions you battle, spiritual or worldly? Um, so what's the hardest thing about being on tour for long periods of time for you? I guess. 
It's funny because this ties in with the last question. I think for me, I battle a lot. I mean, obviously being away from my family is the hardest thing. Even all these years later, um, that's the hardest thing. But, but for me, battling where am I, am I still supposed to be doing this for the Lord? And like, I'm just, that's just me being honest. Like, like I've said this before, like, dude, I, I don't need to be in a band. I don't, I don't need to, I don't, my desire is not to be a rock guy and to stand in front of crowds. Like my, my desire is, dude, is, is God still using this? I battle that all the time. Is God still using me in this music game? And then, and then he'll confirm things over and over again that, that, and it might not be on this mighty scale of whatever, like people think, well, you should be standing on a stage in front of millions of people and proclaim the name of Jesus. Like, dude, God works in so many different ways. I've been doing this almost 30 years, like the relationships that I've built with people and just there's intimacy there and just like the one-on-ones and there's so much stuff going on, but yet, you know, in times like this that are, are rough, that music industry is changing all the time. You're constantly battling like, dude, is like, God, are, are you going to sustain me through this? Am, am I here for the right reasons? You know, this, are you working in my life? Are you, are you doing anything? Um, should I go home and get a regular job? I battle, I battle that all the time. And so when, you know, you do have the people that meet me on the road, I see so many familiar faces on here, just looking at you guys that have been there and you don't even know that you've come alongside me on the tour bus or come and hung out with me. And it's like, dude, and you shared the cool stories that God's doing in your life or you, you know, you blessed me with saying, dude, that this song I was listening to the other day really blessed me or whatever. You don't even know how God's used, you know, a lot of you guys to, to do that and to speak into my own life and say, dude, keep, keep going on, keep hanging in there and keep letting God do what he started. And that's, that's my main thing is just letting or wanting God to finish what he started in, in, in all of this. And then whatever that new chapter is that, that I'll be faithful and ready to jump into it, you know? And, Cause like I said, I don't have a plan B. I always, people always ask me, I don't got a plan B, dude. I'm a working, <laughs> struggling musician, dude. You, you wouldn't think it. I'm out there hustling, and I don't have a plan B. So I'm just waiting for whatever the next chapter is. <laughs> so Sonny, we got about five minutes, you know, and um, I'm trying to read all the questions. But before you leave, I want to make sure you uh, kind of touch on your project with the whosoever so that people might not understand what the whosoever's is, you know, cause I think it's really powerful. And I think there's a lot of resources for people um, yeah. that struggle with depression and kind of what you were talking about, for but sure. that's one thing, but um, I want you, I want to read something that Chuck just uh, wrote. He said, yes, he is. I go to almost every show that I can and mm -hmm. always leave closer to God. I see you baptize me at, at, at the show we love you <laughs> i thought that was kind of cool you know where's chuck, where's chuck? Hey, <laughs> love you dude that's one of my greatest stories we we were we were in arizona and we were playing some crazy venue with this summer tour and they actually it was more like a club and there was a pool big old pool and it was gonna be a pool party all these bands were gonna play and there's this big pool party in the middle where most people would mosh and pit there was a pool party and chuck and his awesome wife they showed up and then he was like, dude, I really want to go to Israel with you, man. And that'd be sick to get baptized over there. He's like, I want to get baptized. And one of the other bands is sound checking and it's just us sitting together. It's super, super hot. And I was like, dude, what's stopping you right now? Let's do it right here. There's a pool. Let's do it. If you're ready, I'll, we'll bat I'll baptize you right now. He's like, what? You would? And then sure enough, dude, he, him and I, we went in. We, we, he got baptized, baptized him right there while the other band was still playing. And then later on, I don't even know if I shared this story with you, Chuck. Uh, all this chaos had happened at the show and cops broke up stuff and all kinds of things went down. But later on, when I was fighting my way to jump in one of the showers, I think it was one of the last guys in the showers, the bass player for that band that was sound checking, he was like, so uh, I want to talk to you about what happened today. And I thought he was going to bring up this, this crazy story of like the cops showing up and all this nonsense, are their friends getting into fights, like all this stuff. And he was like, so uh, when we were sound checking, he was like, did you baptize that dude? <laughs> I was like, oh, I was like, yeah, man. He was like, that's probably the coolest thing I've ever seen, man. <laughs> and I was like, dude, it don't happen all the time. And when it does, it's super special. <laughs> okay, so and one last question, we'll do this one. And 
uh, said, you mentioned the word tolerance. How do you balance truth and grace for people? That's, that's the thing is that I, I believe in the Bible that, you know, there's very big, very big yeses and very big noes. And there's, and there's no, I believe that there's no, there's no compromise in it. I, I stand by the word of God. I'm there, but I also understand that compassion and that grace and that love and that mercy. And, and I don't want to be so dead, right. Well, let me prove to you that that breaks any kind of trust or bond or relationship that we might have, because at the end of the day, if your heart is that this person would come to know the Lord or this person would come to know truth, I'm going to just, I'm just going to demolish them or kill them with that same truth and, and then lose them, send them to hell with that same truth. Like, no, dude, this truth is for us. Now I might not, you know, I'll, I'll be dead honest. If I could somebody, I'd be like, Hey, God, I don't agree, but bro, let's break bread. Let's talk. You tell me, I'll tell you, you listen to me. I'll listen to you. Let's have a real dialogue and conversation, not just how right I think I am, but more so of saying, dude, I love you. I have friends, dude, all over the world. And whenever I see them, I don't see them as these sinners and, and, and they're just these evil people. I just see them as lost, whatever it is. I just see them as they don't know Jesus. And how are they not, if, if, if they don't know Jesus, maybe I'm the only guy that will ever hopefully be an example or, or that person that they might know. And not that I'm anything, and not that I'm anybody, but I'm willing. And we talked about that last thing in preaching the gospel, anything short of sin, that you're willing to go to those lengths. You know, you're willing to go in uncomfortable places. And you're willing to do things like, oh man, well, what are people gonna think or what are they gonna say? You know, ever since I got saved right off the bat, I was already told I wasn't good enough, not Christian enough, music, all this stuff. And I believe that God's done amazing things and he's touched far more people than even I imagine. And, and even I think that I'm worthy of, but I know God has done it. And I'm just going to trust in that because if God put that call in your life, then you just trust it and you follow it. Sweet. All right. So we have a, okay. lot, of, we have a lot of people asking us um, to pray for stuff for them. So Sonny, what I'm going to do is afterwards, I'm going to send you like the chat so you can read. There's some really yeah. cool stuff in here too. Um, there's some really cool encouraging things in here as well you'll like to see so um we awesome. really 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 appreciate you we appreciate your friendship and just yeah. um thank just you, having you in our life and um thank you so much for doing this today i'm gonna let you leave yeah why us. don't you uh close yeah. us uh just let us know what the whosoever's or whatever uh projects you're involved in you know that that bear resources for some of us that yeah, would want to i'll try know. to wrap it up quick with the whosoever's when i when i had taken time even away from music and just wanted to make sure that i was doing the best to, you know i went through this whirlwind of craziness and industry and music and stuff i just wanted to make sure my heart was right with god it's, it was just the god i just wanted to be around real people you know i wanted to be around people that understood and people that i didn't feel like i was hiding and from and or afraid of and i just wanted to be you know people that you could be vulnerable with and, and speak truth and, and have accountability and and this word the whosoever's came up and we know from john 3 16 and often how many times they use the word the bible references whosoever but it says that whosoever should believe it in him should not perish but have everlasting life whosoever should call upon the name of the lord shall be saved so it just seemed very simple and at that time, I was already struggling with trying to identify as this a Christian and what everybody says. Like the, the definition of Christian worldwide, I don't think it's not what Jesus intended. <laughs> Although I, we know what it means, and I know, you know, what I hoped that it would mean <laughs> to be a little Christ, to would be like Jesus. Now, can I honestly say that that our church and that people that represent Jesus are just that? That's a whole nother conversation. But I just wanted to be, wanted to get my life right with the Lord, to be around people that understood. And that's when I saw the whosoever is it's not this organization or this, this religious thing, but it was just saying anybody, God was saying anybody, is there anybody out there, whosoever in this lifetime, in this world, that would believe in my son, just believe in my son, whosoever. So I felt like it was like this gang, you know, it was this gang. It was like, dude, this is, this is the kind of church I want to be a part of, you know, and this was. 
And that's when Ryan came in the picture and, and, and had and, and more musicians and people that were like-minded that worked in the real world and the industry, but, and they, they understood, but they had a passion um, to, to, to see people get saved. And so really it just started more of a brotherhood, sisterhood. And then, um, you know, as time would go on, we get more opportunities to go into schools and, you know, facilities. And now Ryan uh, heads it up and he's doing so many things in the public schools. The public schools are actually asking now that, that we come in and we share our story. And, you know, obviously we have some, some, that's our story. That's all we're doing. We don't go in these schools and then give them a whole Bible lecture. It's just saying, dude, I was lost and now I'm found. I was so, was, life was crazy, but God saved me. And, you know, you have a couple of cool skaters do some tricks. Maybe a guy get on the mic freestyle. We feed them pizzas. We give them t-shirts and skateboards and we tell them Jesus loves them and, and the doors are opening up. So, but the whoservice.com, if you do get a chance, I mean, everything is we do is nonprofit. We sell t-shirts and we take donations. And, but we are in schools all around the world. And that is a testimony of God's grace by itself. Um, and there are resources and there's a community for anybody that does want to reach out there is struggling with, you know, addiction or suicide or just a lot of things. There's people that will not judge you. They will love you. They will pray with you. They will walk you through your storm. Um, no questions asked. And so it is an amazing, awesome community that I love being a part of. Well, again, thank you so much, Sonny. We're going to be respected of your time. And so we're going to say goodbye. Um, you know what I am going to do? I am going to, let's see if I can find him. I know he's in here. I am going to unmute Mr. Marcel Franco and ask him to pray us out. Can you do that? Yeah, sure. Okay, great. <laughs> All right. Um, Lord, I just want to thank you so much for this time we got to spend together, Lord, and I uh, want to thank you especially for Sony, Lord, and for how you've used his life and, and for how you've used his life even during this time here, Lord, to inspire us and to uh, share your word with us, Lord, and I know you are doing something amazing through his life and through a lot of people in this call even, Lord. Uh, so I just want to ask you that you'd help us and, and and really inspire us to be more like you, that you'd help us to be uh, truly your disciples and, and help us, Lord, to become more like you and to serve others and to uh, love others as as you love us, Lord. Uh, so I thank you so much. And I, and I just pray that you'd help everyone here, including myself, Lord, to be more like you. And to and to serve you and love you, Lord, in Jesus' name, Amen. Yeah. Honey, thank you so much. Yeah. So everybody, we're we're here every Tuesday, seven o'clock. Join us next week. Next week, who's? Uh, we have Joe Gruber from uh, Portland Skate Church. He's gonna he's gonna lead us. So yeah. So hopefully you guys show up. Awesome. Thanks, thank honey. You. Take care, Sonny. Thank you, bro. Bye. Talk soon. All right, brother. Bye, bud. See you guys. Later.